know I am in the glam bar in Exeter. Mm -hmm. And um, exciting tonight. We've got three contenders. And uh, you're going to vote for who you want to be your bard for the next year. Um, so I want to start the proceedings by us all joining in to bring down the armour to um, to infuse this space with inspiration for the news uh, for each of our contenders. Um, so we're invoking the three rays of love, truth and justice by doing these three syllables. E R O. E R O. So we'll do that three times. E Since the very dawn of time, mankind has wrestled with two major questions. Uh, why are we here and what is it all about? And uh, that's what I've been asked to explain to you tonight in about <laughs> five minutes. <laughs> so we'll see if we, can, if we can do that. So I'm here to kind of set the context of, of what we're here about, uh, what we're here for and uh, what tonight is about really. Because um, this, is, this night has become synonymous with a competition uh, among some of the best poets in Exeter. Uh, to elect somebody to represent the, the city. It's become very contemporary, uh, very much of, of the age, but it has very, very ancient traditions, as, as you may have guessed from the, from the atmosphere that was invoked and the, uh, the Arwen chanting that, that took place. Um, so just to give you a, a very kind of quick flavour of where it all comes from and, and what the ancient origins are. So uh, we're going back here to at least the Iron Age, um, possibly even further back. And uh, we know from Roman historians that uh, there were three very select castes or groups of people um, that uh, had special privileges back in the Iron Age, back in Iron Age Britain, Iron Age British culture. Uh, there were the Ovates, who were the uh, diviners and the seers and the mediums. There were the Druids, who were the philosophers and the priests. And there were the Bards, and the Bards were the poets. And there were also the history keepers. And there were the people that gave everybody a sense of identity, held the tribes together the lineages held in the secrets, held in the law. And the Bardic tradition continued uh, throughout the ancient times. Uh, the Druidic tradition, which was one of its kind of sister orders, if you like, was, as far as we're aware, driven underground by the Romans. The Romans came to Angle Sea and destroyed the Druids. They chopped down the sacred oak trees. <coughs> and the Druid orders that we know of fell either into obscurity or into secrecy. We do not know for sure. But the Celtic spirit, the flame that kind of lies beneath that, has been revived and, and re-envisaged re -envisaged by different people in different eras throughout history, um, but particularly in the 18th century. So in the 18th century there was a revival of interest in the Celtic tradition, a revival of interest in poetry, romanticism and, uh, and ancient forebears, and uh, Druid orders were set up, people started kind of reenacting Druid rites and recreating Druid orders, and also the Bardic tradition, the poetry tradition, and the two became entwined, if you like. And in the late 1800s, um, a gentleman known, known to us as Yolo Morganic um, was very instrumental in this movement and he's the gentleman that founded what we now know as the Welsh Steadfod and, uh, and later on went to see what we know as the Cornish Gorset and these are well-established traditions of bards. But one of the things that he tried to establish that not so many people know about is he claimed that there were 31 cities 
mainly in England, that had the right to elect their own bard. And he set about trying to re-establish that. Now each, each bardic chair, as we call it, has its own, usually its own Celticized name. So here in Exeter, um, it's known as Kaya Wieska. That's what we call the Exeter bardic chair. Kaya is a Celtic word which means uh, city or settlement. Um, if you look at modern Welsh, if you look at Cardiff, the word Cardiff comes from Kaya. The car in Cardiff is the Kaya. So Exeter is Kaya Wieska. Wieska is, is the river, the River X. And that's where, that's where our ancient name comes from. And like all the other 31 ancient bardic, ancient bardic seats, uh, that lie in, uh, mainly in England, um, it has its own specific location as well. Mostly they're associated with some kind of mound or hill. The first one that was reclaimed was actually Primrose Hill in London. And uh, I was lucky enough to go up there recently, and there's actually a plaque commemorating Yoel Organic and the establishment of the Bardic Chairs in England and in Wales, in fact, whole Britain. Uh, but the location that's associated with Bardic Chair in Exeter is Rougemont, the Red Mound, which is where the castle is today. That's the ancient. Seat, if you like, of body chair, but I think there's a lot more comfortable to the okay. ceremony, poetry compositions. So that will give you a kind of flavour of what happened. So Yolo Morganic um, started to try and re-establish this tradition. Um, uh, a very annoying kind of joint foreigner gentleman known as Napoleon um, made things rather difficult and uh, got in the way and caused lots of uh, lots of kind of hold-ups. So therefore, it wasn't until the 1990s um, that anybody actually did anything about the invention of body chairs. Um, and uh, there's a gentleman in, uh, in Bath called Tim Sebastian um, who, um, who has the credit of re-establishing the whole tradition from there on in. Bath became the first re-established bardic chair. That was known as Kaya Madol, that was the, the, ancient, um, the ancient bardic chair of Bath, and that was re-established. Re uh, I was lucky enough to be around at the time in Bath. Uh, I won the competition to be the uh, bardic chair of Bath. And shortly after then I moved to, uh, down to Devon, didn't know anyone, didn't know anything. Of, uh, I kind of realised that Exeter was a vacant and empty body chair. Um, so I had the kind of foolishness really to uh, try and do something about that, which took many, many years because I didn't know anyone, I didn't have any networks. Um, but luckily, um, you know, my, my lesson from this really is if, if something's important and something means something to you, keep at it. Um, tenaciousness is really important, tenacity is very important. Um, and um, we're now on, I think we're trying to work it out, aren't we? I think we're on our sixth spot now. Mm, I think it is. Um, so, um, so, the, so the tradition is, is well established, and I think you know, Exeter is going to have a bard right into the future. You know, and the bard reigns for a year and a day. Um, I'm sure Jackie will ex explain some of the duties of bard and some of the other aspects of, of what uh, being a bard means. So, uh, thanks to people like yourselves who have come along tonight to support us, the bardic tradition is alive and well in Exeter and will continue. Children and, and sort of heads forward, really. So thank you very much for coming along tonight. I hope that gives you kind of flavour of where we've where we've come from, and, uh, and now it's uh, it's up to you guys to see where we go from here. Thank you very much. Thanks. So that place has always had a, a strong um, connection for me. And then when I became the Grand Bard, I felt like I wanted to honour those women. Not just those three women, um, but all of them before, all the women accused of witchcraft, and of course men. And all those since, because it still is happening through prejudice and so on. Um, so last summer, um, near the anniversary of their deaths, I put on the Grand Witch's Tea Party um, in the gardens. We had an amazing day. It, it just snowballed. It, it was a bit crazy because we ended up being on um, BBC One, the one show, which I didn't even know existed because I've got a telly. Um, and we got in all the papers, uh, the Independent, the Times, everything. It just went, I even saw it on a Chinese um, international news site. <laughs> um, and people came from all over England and Wales. Um, 
um, to honour these women and it was a very moving ceremony. Um, and this year we're going to do something a bit different. Um, but I'm putting on a grand witch's ball, so it's an evening before, uh, evening event at the Phoenix, which of course is right next to Rougeon. And um, that's on September the 12th, I believe, which is a Saturday. And what we have planned for that is um, a lot of entertainment. We've got bands, we've got um, lots of stalls, we've got really unusual acts, horror films and things like that. Seance kind of thing going on. Uh, poets, singers, storytellers, you name it. Um, so uh, that's one thing I'm doing. I uh, just forgot what else I was going to say. Oh, yes. So um, for that event, I wrote a poem, uh, and I'd just like to do that poem now. <laughs> it's called Every Woman. I am your grandmother, killed for celebrating on Hallows. I am your mother, dragged from my bed to the gallows. I am your sister, a conquest of war at gunpoint. I am your daughter, a victim online at some point. I need you, every woman who hears me, to speak up for those without voices. I need you, every man who loves me, to protect me, to make the right choices. I'm your grandmother, your mother, your sister, your daughter. I call from beyond the mystery to say no to the horror, the betrayal and the slaughter. We must right the wrongs of history. I need you, every woman who hears me, to speak up for those without voices. I need you, every man who loves me, to protect me, to make the right choices. Uh, yeah, 
okay, so uh, one sort of contribution to the bar ship that uh, I've sort of made, not entirely by my own volition, partly it's more of an accident really, but uh, there's also another uh, tradition that happens in Exeter, organised by um, a few artists, people involved in phonic, uh, which is called Green Man um, event, which basically the Green Man, in the cathedral, if you've ever seen, uh, well, there's pubs called the Green Man, you must have come across a pub called the Green Man, um, and in cathedrals, churches and stuff, you might often see uh, a stone face with leaves coming out of its eyes, ears, mouth, you know, quite a, quite a bizarre thing, but that's obviously like a quite a pagan thing, but it's obviously managed to uh, survive and sort of found its way into, into churches. It's the day of the green man was kind of developed from a uh, kind of little ritual where they would kind of make a uh, a foliage kind of effigy of, of, of someone they'd, they'd chop his head off but obviously the implication is that their head would, would keep growing back and um, yeah they, they with the May Day festival um, there's a lot of uh, the, the green man is quite associated with that they had a Jack in the Green festival as well again to do with May Day also with Robin Hood His day was on. His day was on May Day. He used to have like a Robin Hood games, which was basically like uh, Robin Hood plays with like Morris dancers. Uh, would do kind of quite folky theatre. Um, and now they've kind of resuscitated him. And uh, every year, this guy um, dresses up in a in a bush, basically put together by lots of artists, and he, and he comes around and kind of gives out. Anyway, last year I did a poem for this, which they did on the radio. I'll read that out for you now. And it's called The Circuit. <clears throat> Three miles from the city in the pitch black dark, scents alone are strung across the blind space, aromas of the cold wet earth, vegetation and bark. Dawn's first light dissipates like a dye, diluting the black <coughs> to indigo. A shadow there, a raggedy clump of leaves piled on twigs, it groans, fidgets, rustles, gives a snort and sniffs. Indigo turns violet, here is a forest, trees, a mist peels from the ground and lifts, rolling slowly out of view. Mauve turns to violet, above canopy is bare, branches and twigs form a lattice, a meshwork, a matrix, etched against pre-dawn sky in angular fine line, a natural language. He dreams letters from the branch ink weave, constructs words from them, and the words converge to waveforms and oscillations in his mind, it asks him to complete the circuit. Carefully he dreams the words back to their letters, floats the letters back to their place in the lattice. Buds appear on the branches like punctuation. The sky shocks electric blue and the buds begin to flash and hum. He rocks onto his heels and shins, pushes up from his thighs, shakes out the dirt, dirt and the earwigs and begins to move off. From above you would see the city as a node connected to the forest by a small country road. And now along the pavement, under zinging morning sun, slowly towards the city, shambolic and strange, the green man comes. Is his name Martin? Is he called Neil? He's the cultural manifestation of the photonic field. Four billion years ago, on an inhospitable planet very different from our own, lightning flashed above the back black smog, billowing out the volcanoes and in the pools of terrible chaos. Complex molecules were formed, 
Then one day sunlight buzzed a cell alive, and life on earth was born. And from these cells that photosynthesize comes everything we see. The soil, buildings, animals, the very air we breathe. And no one knows the reason why or how life came to be, but we'd be nothing, bored in nowhere, if it wasn't coloured green. That pulse transformed to vegetation, eventually humankind sparked up, and we live in accordance with the seasons of the sun and of all the days throughout the year. Spring equinox was best when the Druids could let their beards down, suck their mead and dance and jest. It was a time of regeneration. It was a time of procreation, entertainment, celebration. And to their sacred rituals of total inebriation always came the green man singing make hay while the sun shines and enjoy life while you can. Slowly towards the city, shambolic and strange, the green man comes. Is his name Graham? Is he called Jack? They tried to chop his head off, but it kept growing back. A new religion came and put the old one to the sword. They put the moon out for the book and put the sun out for the law. The green man was rather hardy though, and he found himself a niche, a grotesque hidden in the churches, in the alcoves and the eaves, snorting, weeping, spewing forth a gushing torrent of leaves. He skipped across to literature, and in Sherwood Forest re-emerged as Robin Hood, a wire by which fat cat barons were urged. Robin Hood Day was May Day, then May Day became Jack the Green. And the Jack of the Greens returning, as the Green Man will soon see, slowly towards the city, shambolic and strange, the Green Man comes. Is his name Stuart? Is he called Nigel? He's Peter Pan, the Swamp Thing, the Toxic Avenger. Ever young, relentless, always stronger for the mire. They tried to chop his head off, but it kept growing back. Is his name Kevin? Is he called Jack? Is he called Martin? Is he called Neil? He's the cultural manifestation of the photonic field. He's the mysterious but not too serious generative force personified as man, singing make hay while the sun shines and enjoy life while you can. He's not a poser. He's a farmer. He's a gardener at heart. He's a basic universal kind of hero. He's the lowest form of art. You can speak to him and touch him. He will like it if you laugh. Shambolic and strange, the green man approaches the city. Morning sun touches the branches of a nearby poplar tree. They tremble as if shot. He reads the whole thing now, and as his leafy foot falls upon an Exeter street, springs here and everywhere, the world, the town, all fully charged now. The eyes and lungs are ozone fresh and clean. The fragrance of the flowering air is sweet, and all actions, all pulses of joyous hearts complete the circuit.
easy, it's a lot more pressured when you're in that kind of, you're being timed, you're kind of competing, it's really hard, it's a lot harder than just standing up and waffling. Um, so please be, be very, very generous with um, welcoming them onto the stage and, and with your appreciation afterwards. Uh, I'm just going to draw a name on random, they're going to come up and entertain you. Manifesto, <coughs> and they're also going to perform for you. Um, everyone should have found a little slip with a, a voting slip on it when they came in on the show. Yeah. Um, it's pretty easy to work <coughs> out. It's first place, second place, third place, champion, and so down. So everyone's going to get different points uh, for that. Okay, right, so our first competitor is the wonderful Elsie Katz. Inspiration can walk with its feet on the ground. It can fly like the swift. It can burst into the music of the earth and stars. Truth and meaning flow, blossom and grow from Estuary Seaside Exmouth where I organise open mic to the city streets and lively theatres of Exeter, across the county from coast to coast and almost to Bristol's happening port where part of my saga is set. If I am elected Bard of Exeter, I urge you to join me and we shall nurture creativity indoors, outdoors, any which way we can. Okay. Uh, the lines that I sing are from the Stevie Wonder song Free. There are four lines of spoken word which I have cut up and pasted from the Sex Pistols, Pretty Vacant and God Save the Queen, and the rest is my own. Xanthi, a story in poetry. Free like a river, flowing freely to infinity. Free to be sure of who I am, what I want. Xanthi is born. The goddess decides in Exmouth you were made, and here shall I hold you. And in a ratty St Andrew's Road bedsit where mushrooms sprout in the kitchen cabinets and mould spatters its creeping scattergun invasion and on a carpet stained noisy ochre with the remnants of the last tenant's vomit, <coughs> baby Xanthi plays banging her rat-a-tat, one stick, two stick, red and blue circus triangle little drum. And in the warm May moon rise, her mother pushes baby and buggy down to the beach. She parks her buggy, kicks off her sandals, rushes to the sea to taste the sharp bite and slap against her legs. Then scrunching the wet grainy sand against all the crevices and cracks of her ten toes, rushing back, grasping the handles of her buggy and looking at the retro pink and village green and holiday blue string of lights along the crom, she wishes and wishes for the letter from the council, 
and rat a tat tat it falls on the map the offer of a whole new council flat with two bedrooms up the road in Littleham. And we're here with the little folks in Littleham. Don't fear, we're here in Littleham. We're an all right lot here, one and all, but we're little trees here. We don't grow so tall. Xanthi grows much too big for Littleham. We're so pretty, we don't care. Rip jeans, pierced no spiky hair. Vacant hate for Tory state. God out the Queen, you're so obscene. Smoke weed, sniff blue, don't like it, screw you. I'm in a punk band and I'm moving to Bristol. Life flowing through me like I feel my father. God has called free to be nothing but possessing riches more than all. And I'm free to be nowhere but in every place I want to be. The art graffitied on the walls, the joys of squatting in Stokes Hill, the rosy red, the vibrant green, the purples blazoning the sea, the sun, the stars, the trees, the flowers, the lazy, hazy, slipshod hours, holding hands, walking down the towpath, toking down in pints, and at night in the cellar bar, Xanthi's drum, her boyfriend's thrash guitar, and the crowd with their jets, black and poison green mohawks, stomping, shouting, cheering, going mental for it, and in the cellar bar, every woman and man is feeding on the gods, is raising pan. Then back home, the fervent, loving coupling of adult snakes and almost Eden. And when did this happen? And it's home again to little. And sweet little baby girl of mine, your life stretched out on a washing line with baby grows and ribbons and bows and you're so sweet so everyone tells me and yes I can see your loveliness but my womb is not a candy floss machine and it's me that's getting eaten alive and mother please when she goes to school can I go back to Bristol and leave her with you Rising joy and built up bliss on the first great western train that at Exeter St David's becomes a bus because it's Sunday and the bus goes through the Clifton Bridge and the rain drums and spatters on the windows and the little houses turn to big houses with pastel slipshod colours and then the city shows her big backside with the vacant factories and the canal washing and slapping and finally the clock tower and the staunch grey walls of Bristol Temple Meads. And as dawn sheds her tattered dignity on streets of colourful renewal and straggly weirdos freely rove and play, Xanthi works. She blogs, she flogs ideas, she drums, she strums, she raises cash, she leases the cellar bar, a beacon wide and far for thrash guitar and punk and open mic. And her daughter grows in childhood time, on her life stretched out on a little um, line with ankle socks and grey school frocks and pink leotard and purple gym air text and prom dress in year 11 and Christmas swim with Santa hat 
and beautiful fancy dress on New Year's Eve to impress the journal and <laughs> when did this happen? And mom, please come home and help. And for now, Bristol. And it's all right back home in Littleham. Lost the fight for now. Back home. Freer than a pumpkin drop falling from the sky. Freer than a smile in a baby's sleeping eye. Three women stand ready to care for the new baby. Xanthi, her own mother, and her daughter. Four souls alive that thrive in eczema. <laughs> It 
wasn't good enough. If luck makes good poetry, this is the best, and it is not good enough. So that's that one. <laughs>
stuff. I, I, I'm kind of staying, staying positive here. And there's obviously the other side of love, but I'm, I'm staying positive tonight. Stay positive. Um, it's not totally because it kind of looks back over the whole event, really. Um, it's a life. It tries to. It's called to-do list, which is a bit weird. For one